Hi folks, this is uh, Dick Boston, Executive Editor Jason Premis, and I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, segment. This is going to be a Better Boston Art segment. This is a new series that I'm doing um, with a variety of uh, kind of arts mavens around the city uh, to talk about uh, what they think um, folks in the art scene can do to rebuild that scene uh, after the, uh, the tragic and horrible <laughs> Uh, coronavirus pandemic that we're all going through is over. So today, this is the first one, and uh, t I thought I would start with uh, somebody that I've been friends with for some years, and has been a collaborator. I've been a collaborator with for a long time. I'm going to bring him on now. One second, we'll just switch over. It's my friend uh, Shay Justice, and uh, he's a, a, a well-known uh, Boston artist, and he's also an educator. And uh, welcome, Shay, to this to this show. It's nice Thank to have you, you here. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So, so we're just going to kind of, you know, ease into the into the topic today. You know, we're going to try to talk about the past to get to the present. Um, and I thought that uh, obviously the, the best place to start is, you know, who are you, Shay Justice? You know, what what's your background? How did you get into the into the arts? You know, what kind of art do you do? Uh, and we can kind of go from there. So, you know, um, what, what's up? Okay. Um I grew up in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Um, I went to Boston University, uh, graduate of English High. Uh, later on, years later, you and I met when I was at Lesley University. Nine years ago and almost 10 now. Yep. Yep. I um, teach over at Lincoln Sudbury Regional High School. Uh, I've been drawing and painting since I was a small, small kid, five, six years old or something like that. Oh. Back in the day when there used to be a um, TV show on in Needham called Drawing from Nature with Captain Bob Cottle. Yeah. I was one of the biggest viewers. And um, yeah, that, that's essentially it. I got a teenage, a grown son who's 20 now. And mm. uh, I've just been participating in a lot of art activities, whether it's Jamaica Plain Open Studios, Roxbury Open Studios. Um, I'm a member of AMARP right now. Um, I've also been a member of Boston Metropolitan Artists Guild. Right. So I've I've been around the scene for a while. And we're going to talk about AMAR more the African American uh, Master Artist in Residence program. That's a that's actually kind of central to what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, oh yeah. Especially in terms of the recent past and uh, the various depredations by the establishment. Uh, I'm doing this, uh, you know, um, uh, in Boston uh, versus you know a lot of artists and arts institutions that are being destroyed or damaged. But okay. That's a good background. And, and so, you know, what's your, what's your primary medium? Like, what do you do as an artist? Um, I do political illustrations, drawings, paintings. Um, I work in a variety of medium, depending on how I feel or what I want to experiment with. So I've worked with watercolor. Um, I'm only, I emphasize portraits when I do watercolors, but I also work in collage. Mm -hmm. I love to do a lot of image and text combinations. Um, and most of it references um, historical or political figures or events that have happened in American history. Right. And I mean, yeah. we could even, um, we might as well go ahead and show a couple of your works. And I apologize to the audience. This will be slightly inelegant. I think you'll see my shoulders behind these images. But um, I'm going to pull up here the uh, Eric Garner, um, you know, a piece that you did relatively recently. And why don't you uh, talk about that? For folks for a second um it's it's a monochromatic gray uh photo of when they strangled eric garner to death um part of the reason i chose monochromatic color because for me the event was as clear as black and white it was a murder um i added the caution um sign to it because the man who had filmed eric garner um, murder and it was a murder um was ended up later on arrested on some other charges and they tried to hold him indefinitely and they tried to actually kill him when he was in jail. Mm. Um, that piece permanently is on display at the Grove Hall Library um, where Paul Edwards um, works. He runs the library and he's a major advocate for the arts yeah. and social justice and change. So he's invited me and you as well when we did mm. our Boston Strong question mark exhibit to be there and um, He's asked me and a number of other artists if there were pieces we'd be willing to donate as a permanent part of the collection. That was one of the ones I chose to cho chose to um, give them. Word. And then uh, let's let's pull up the George Floyd image. 
And what can you tell folks about that? Um, that one I just recently finished, and that was a sketchbook drawing I had posted on Facebook. Um, I was working on this summer, or I drew it this summer. Um, I was really depressed and, and shocked when I saw the video footage. Uh, and I only, I only could watch it once, and it almost left me in tears. And the, the, the callousness of the police officer's hands in his pocket or the other cops who were just standing there blocking witnesses from helping this man – while they just murdered him outright. Um, so I chose, when I was looking at the photo, I chose to turn the bumper of the police van into the uh, American flag because these kinds of murders have happened since 1619 of African Americans and African in general are bodies and that the state basically sanctions, sanctions these kinds of murders. So for me, it's like, it's, un, it's qualified immunity that has been ongoing for 400 years. So if you look at it close enough, you'll notice almost like fumes coming out of the tailpipes um, that's basically strangling him. And those fumes represent America's constantly killing of us or destroying our bodies, which makes us not be able to breathe, just as violent as the man's neck is on, I mean, on, knee is on his neck. And below, below uh, Floyd, you see the exact, I cut out and pasted the exact quotes he said just before he died. Wow. So those are in the image as well. Folks might look real close at the screen to see those, but they are there, yeah. And then it, yeah. it, I can't breathe is at the bottom. Yeah, you know? and when he was saying about crying for his mother. Um, if you look behind the police officer in the back, it says Black Lives Matter because it's almost like it's a distant thought or right. it's something that's elusive that's never going to, it's very, very difficult to notice or spot. And to that because, point, it had been, it had been kind of in the background for a few years after its initial breakout as a yeah. movement in 2014, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I remember how people were very, when, when um, Michael Brown was murdered by the police officer, how saying Black Lives Matter, the first thing you got were white people saying, that's racist against white people. Mm. The, the lack of understanding or the lack of, well, what exactly do you mean? It's like, once again, we get put in a position where we have to educate right. for people who, in a lot of cases, I believe are willfully ignorant. They just don't want to do the due diligence to understand what's being said or what people mean. They just want you to jump through hoops to convince them that there's an injustice or a wrongdoing. Yeah. Well, let me get, let me, um, I'll take the uh, image down so you can see us both again. So, I mean, this is kind of a good way to, you know, like get into the kind of core discussion now. I mean, first of all, you know, you're a political artist, you're an African American artist. And you're operating in Boston, Massachusetts, which might have a couple of problems with racism, yeah, <laughs> you know, in its in its yeah. history up to the very right now, right? Yeah, I know. I'm worth eight dollars. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> worth eight dollars. We we're number one. Yeah. So so like, um, and we are indeed, you know, one of the most segregated cities in America, and and therefore the world, you know, <laughs> and uh, that's nothing to be proud of. Um, and, and we're segregated in a number of ways, by race, yes, but also by class and in a number of other ways. And um, so, so is the art scene. Is, yes. Was that fair, a fair statement? Um, um, yeah. And in fact, I mean, I, I hesitated in this series to even use the, the term art scene, because I think there are scenes. Um, you know, so what, what art scene are you in? Like, what part of the art scene are you in, would you say? Um... It's gotten, it's, it's getting smaller and smaller, the art scene that I'm a part of, not because it's by choice, mm -hmm. but it's because of, by opportunity. Right. For instance, um, when I moved back to Boston, it was about 25, 26 years ago, when I, because I, I lived in Florida for a couple of years. Um, when I got married, we moved to Jamaica Plain, partly because of the art scene. And they used to have a thing called Jamaica Plain Open Studios, they still do. Mm -hmm. Where all up and down the neighborhoods, all around Jamaica Plain, all the way towards Green Street and um, Stony Brook, people had their houses open. And you, you could go into their houses and they were selling their artwork or displaying copies of their work. And there was food and you could talk about arts and all this other stuff. It had a real uh, Hyde Ashbury Bohemian kind of feel to it. <laughs> yeah, I kind of remember. Oh, yeah. And what ended up happening was when they got rid of like rent control... 1994 and 95 yep. is when it really came in. I got affected, yeah. 
Yeah. When they started getting rid, a lot of the artists started disappearing. Yep. And then the fire station off Center Street, which is now J.P. Licks, yep. that used to be an art studio and they had art classes and things there. Um, the Elliott Church, I think they still kind of have art classes there now. But there used to be all this stuff that was going on. So now, years later, you don't have most open studios when they have them. A lot of the art is uh, in front of businesses or storefronts. You got to yeah. go in there. So if you want to go into like a real estate office and look at some paintings, you got to go do that. It's not a lot of neighborhood. Oh, my apartment is open for people to come check out my work situations anymore. And sometimes they have a little bit of stuff outside, but it's not the same as it once was. Um, I've been a part of Roxbury Open Studios. The same thing. I think they've suffered a lot worse in terms of open studios there. Right. There's a lot <clears throat> less places. I've participated in exhibits with the artists at the Piano Factory. Yeah. Uh, Paul Goodnight, Equa Holmes, and different people. We They used to have art shows in the basement art gallery there. But since the owner decided to turn that spot into a condominium, he basically evicted many of those artists who, who basically turned that building from nothing into something really special. Now he has it as a condo. He got rid of the um, gallery in the basement, turned it into office space. There's another gallery on the other side, but it, it's hardly ever utilized. It's all right, but... It, it's all Boston. Once you start walking around, it's all Boston. It's well, yes and no, because we're talking about two Bostons. You know, like where where do black people live in Boston? What neighborhoods? At the rate we're going now, eventually <laughs> Brockton. Right, right, which yeah. is outside of Boston. But I yeah, mean, but so, you know, you've mentioned. So JP in some yeah. parts of the neighborhood, some parts are very expensive and a lot more white, right? Yeah. Pond side, for example, near the Jamaica Pond and stuff like that. And then, you know... Um, over, over towards Eggleston Square and elsewhere, you know, in the, in the exactly. park, Big Franklin Park, you're talking more African-American, right? Also more Latino. Yeah. And, uh, and then Roxbury, which you've mentioned, is, is, a, is a black section of Boston. Uh, parts of Dorchester, not as much as before. And then yeah. Mattapan, right? Those yeah. kind of the major area. And then the South End, right? Parts yes. of the South End. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of like it, right? <laughs> and then uh, all yeah. the other parts of Boston, there are black people in those places, but not not like a lot. A community, not not like a community of yeah. Right. Now, in terms of the art scene, you know, so there is there like a, an African American art scene or scenes, and like you know what, how does that manifest? Um, well, since the pandemic and the quarantine happened, it's not much. Uh, the the Amart group has had every single Saturday at um three o'clock, um, what's called Justice on the Stoop, where we have an open exhibit and poetry reading or music um, event in front of the um, Amart building over on Atherton Street near Stony Brook. I just participated yesterday. Um, but that's that, that actually started out in July as a protest because Northeastern reneged on an agreement with Amart and locked us out and tried to lie about it and all this other stuff. But I mean, obviously you'll ask me about that later on. Mm -hmm. um, in terms mm -hmm. of a scene, it, it's not a, other than the open studios when they happen. And even those are small, <clears throat> there's not a lot because if there were, I'd be able to tell you more because right. I would definitely want to participate, but it, it's just not a lot. And if cool. there are other scenes that are out there, it would be new to me. If, if you like said, well, have you ever gone here? Have you ever gone there? I'd be like, no, I didn't know about it. Well, I'm asking because, you know, obviously Boston has an overall scene. And yeah. I mean, I think it would be fair to say that it's predominantly white, although it is changing, I mean, to some yeah. extent. And certainly the gallery scene, the place where people are like paying money for works. I mean, that's that's pretty dominated, I think, by white artists. I think that would also be. And they're suffering say. pretty bad, too, because yep. I remember once upon a time you go up and down Newberry Street from Copley Square all the way to Heinz Convention Center, there were galleries on the left and on the right. You go there now, a lot of those galleries are gone. They're yep. mostly clothing stores or pot shops. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah a lot true. of those galleries are gone. And I mean, that's one reason I'm doing the series is to kind of talk about, because we, in, at Dick Boston, we've already been, we've had a number of articles in the last, in the, certainly the three years since my partners, uh, Chris Ferrone and John Loftus and I took over the, the mm -hmm. paper. You know, we've been running a series. It's not formal, but it's just been happening 
of like mm -hmm. all the attacks on arts institutions, uh, yeah. mostly by, well, you're going to talk about this too more, I'm sure, but, you know, real estate developers and, yeah. you know, other kinds of sort of powerful interests in Boston that want to do one thing or another with different facilities, uh, usually to the detriment of the people using those facilities. So if it's artists, it's one thing. If it's like kids, it's another thing, you know, but, but they're getting, you know, these community spaces, these public spaces are getting uh, uh, wiped out one after the other. And this is across the arts, by the way. This is mm -hmm. dance, this is music, this is the visual arts, which is what we're talking about today, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that discussion certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm winding up to stuff here with you, you know, um, be, because um, if even that scene where there has been money and status and privilege is going down, then, then what could be happening? And you've already basically said it, to the African-American art scene or scenes, you know, there's not much there, right? Yeah. Just, you know, I mean, like institutions like Museum of Fine Arts try to do some stuff around Juneteenth after some community pressure uh, more than once. Well, they had, they, had to, they had to pull themselves out mm -hmm. of, of the shithole, the, the crap they put themselves in when that class of kids of color showed up and they treated them badly. Yeah. Um, that wasn't long ago at all, right? That was an, yeah. a, a couple of years ago? Yeah. That was maybe one or two years ago. Yeah. But um, I had a similar experience at the, the MFA about eight years ago, and I refused to ever do membership or chaperone school trips there. Mm -hmm. And I was very clear with the MFA about <laughs> that when I filed a complaint against two security guards, who one of whom said something really offensive to me and tried to provoke a physical confrontation. Hmm. And I kept my calm. And when I reported him, they um, went after the woman who was a black woman who took my report, who took my report <laughs> because he, the, the guy who started the whole situation yelled at her as well. Wow. And they tried to fire her. Wow. And so when I called to find out hmm. what was the outcome of the situation and they said, we're not going to discuss <clears throat> personnel issues with outsiders and all this other stuff. I happened to run into her at one point. And I asked her and she had told me that they had tried to fire her. And she got her job back. But they don't know. She didn't think that they were going to do anything to the, the two guys who did that to me. It was two guys who um, it turned into an ugly situation over me carrying a bag with my sketchbook in it right. when it was raining outside. Right. And I was told, you got to yeah. check your bag. And then they went. Um, I said, I saw a woman walk by me with her bag and an umbrella. And I said, well, my bag is smaller than hers. What's the big deal? And instead of it being a calm situation, he started swearing at me and saying, I can't stand how you black people are always acting. And it got really ugly and it ex escalated really quickly. Right. Um, and so after I, I after that happened years later, I had, I had outright wrote a letter to them and I said, I'll never renew my membership. And as a school teacher, I would never chaperone my students on a trip to this museum again. We were so both uh, eight years ago MFA students in the visual arts program at Arts, arts, arts Institute of Boston at the time, right? This would have been 2012. Yeah. 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 And you were just graduating. You were like a, literally about to graduate. Yeah. Um, might have been right around that time in June of 2012 or whatever. But yeah, yeah that was, you know, and this is just par for the course, unfortunately. And ironically, as a labor organizer, I helped the union of those museum guards on multiple occasions you know, like fight for better contracts and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's even more gross, you know, to, to hear that, you know, people who seem to be decent people harbor individuals that are not decent, you know. Yeah, yeah but the history of unions, you, you know. I know. They don't want no blacks in the membership right. at all. So right. I wouldn't say that that union, you know, had that attitude. But, you know, who works these kinds of jobs? A lot of times it's artists, actually, that work those jobs as as floor walkers, you know, or, or guards or whatever they're called at the different institutions, you know, um, and that that means since most art students are white to this day, even though Massachusetts is the only state in the union that has a public art school, which neither of us went to, but MassArt, which is right yep. near the MFA. Yeah. You know, um, this is kind of what it is. You get a lot of white guards, you know, with with all the prejudices they bring along with them to the job. So, yeah. Look, OK, so MFA was trying to make up for that and other many other grievances and doing oh, stuff yeah. on Juneteenth and doing certain programs. And now they've tried to, and we'll be talking about this. I'm, my, my, uh, 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 one of our arts writers, Heather Kaplow, is doing a series on how arts institutions are responding to the Black Lives Matter movement this year. 
um, starting. We just did a piece. She just did a piece uh, on the Boston Center for the Arts. We'll get around to MFA, and it will be interesting to talk to them about you know how they're trying to change and improve. You know. Oh yeah. But okay, yeah. all right. So, so yeah, we're just they got to behave themselves. We're setting I did this. Go, I did go to their um, Nubian exhibit. Mm -hmm. which I thought was a major, major significant accomplishment on their end because they acknowledge that the Nubian collection of art that they had there, number one, it had been in storage and they never really did anything with it, but that um, the, the archaeologist for the MFA who had gotten a lot of the information about the ancient Nubians had been racist against dark-skinned black people in general and had a skewered vision of the historical aspect of who the Nubians were. Hmm. And the fact that the MFA acknowledged it and acknowledged <clears throat> how wrong he was and that Nubians were intelligent, they were brilliant, and they had conquered the Egyptians. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. It, it was like a significant <clears throat> step forward that I was like, wow. They really, because yeah. my first thought was they really <clears throat> trying to make up for their screw up. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's certainly a lot of nice, well meaning people there, you know, trying to do the right thing, but they don't always run the show in general. And, and this comes out in times like this. Also, you know, in fairness, human resources departments, however, however well run they are, are going to let some people slip through that are going to have views that may not be immediately evident. But I don't want to let them off the hook, you know, like for this kind of stuff either. Yeah. Um, so, OK, I mean, we've kind of set the stage a little bit of, of what well, Boston's like, you know, and, and what it's like to be African-American, an African-American artist in Boston and what the art scenes are, are kind of like. They're, they're, in free, they're kind of in free fall now. Um, yes. and, uh, the African-American art scene is, is barely there, you know, um, and in the midst of this process, we have one of the, one of the few kind of, um, African-American arts institutions that was supported by a, a major university, which is, is the African-American, African-American master, uh, uh, artists in residence program that you've been part of for how many years now? About 20. Yeah. And that, yep. that program is about 40 years old now. And, yes. um, w you know, I think this would be a good time to talk about, first of all, what that program is, where it came from, and then mm -hmm. what's been happening to it in the last few years. It was created by Dana Chandler, um, who was a professor at Northeastern years ago. And um, it basically was tr to force Northeastern, as Northeastern slowly was going to expand, to address the needs of African Americans that lived around the area, because like if you remember, I don't you, you've been in Boston long enough, you remember right across where their big soccer field was near Wentworth Institute, that used to be the project. Yep. They tore it down, turned it into soccer field, and what have you. So Northeastern's had a gradual expansion. Yep. Um, years ago, they wanted the building over at 76 Atherton Street, and in order to get the um, zoning permit for it, they had to agree to allow African-American artists to take a residence there or have a space for there. So AMAR was, was the group. First, they used to be over on Huntington Avenue. I wasn't a part of them then. And then I was part of them when they got sent over to Atherton Street in the current building. Um, the programs involve exhibits, um, workshops, and activities with local kids. There used to be a thing called the Peace Drum Project. <sighs> that another artist got to do, um, Susan Porter had to, got to um, do with teenagers in the community who would come in and do art and things after school. And it was called the Peace Drum Project. So there've always been workshops and activities that were happening there. Um, what ended up happening was um, they decided that they wanna either sell the building or do something with the building and they had evicted us. And instead of an eviction, they tried to accuse us of being squatters. Then it turned into, well, you all don't have the right to the name AMARP. Then it turned into, um, apparently years ago, the, the zoning agreement that we did have or that AMARP had with them, one of their lawyers or one of their people came and rewrote it and had never confirmed or discussed it with anyone. So then it was an issue of their rewrite versus what the original agreement contracts had said. And so... This was dirty, this was underhanded, and it led to eventually the city of Boston and the mayor's office being involved in this. Right. So there's there's attorneys involved. Northeastern tried to do this thing where they were gonna give us a space and pay for the repairs to this other space, 
but they were going to um, not allow uh, this space somewhere in Dorchester, not that far from uh, the Wangs, not the Wangs, the, the one near um, the Mather Elementary School. I can't remember the name of that, that theater that's over there. In uh, 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 oh, you, um, Strand? Strand, there yeah. you go. I always okay. said Wang Center. The yeah. Strand Theater. I should remember the Strand because when I was in elementary school, I remember going on a field trip there to see the Nutcracker. Yeah. Um, but across the street from there. My mom's side's from Dorchester, for those in the audience that don't know that. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they were going to pass us off over to this other space, and then the the um, space would have been uh, – repaired and they would have they would have done two years of paying the rent or, or something like that but the rent was so astronomically high after two years it wouldn't have been viable for us um, to even support ourselves in that particular space and we should be clear that the atherton space was already a come down from the original space which was most of a building or all of a building it was bigger yeah. there was more people and staff and programs yeah 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 northeastern put more money into it and they've yeah. just been cutting back and cutting back really for exactly. almost 20 years now, I think, almost since you came on board. Yeah. It's been like in this downward trajectory. And how many artists are left attached to it? How many studios are in the, in the space? Uh, one, uh, is it a dozen or is it 15. one? 15, yeah, 15. yeah. And um, mostly older, right? Like you're, aren't you the baby of the group pretty much? Uh, Marlon's a little bit younger than me. I think Marlon's almost 40, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the Ron Woods of the, the Rolling Stones. Yeah. <laughs> you're pushing 50. <laughs> even, yeah. Though I've, even though I've been there since the 80s or whatever, I'm still considered the baby except like the Ron Woods, <laughs> the Rolling Stones. Well, you know, so I mean, um, but this is still a significant institution and there aren't a lot of institutions like this and now it's in trouble. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, the thing was, when they told everyone you can't go in to do work or do anything because of the quarantine, they allowed Barnes & Noble's employees, because they have a warehouse on the side of our building, to go back to work. But they changed the locks on us yeah. and didn't confirm or tell any of us this. So we couldn't even get into the building. And then it became, we'll let you in the building, but you need our permission. And if you go in the building, we'll have security there. And you're only allowed to be in the building for a half hour. Now, how are artists supposed to work like this? Um, we're not. Yeah. It's, to, it's, it's, an, it's an attempt to starve us out. Now, this isn't the first time they've changed the locks. When they did it before in the mayor, even the great Mel King came for a protest we had. Um, what they ended up doing was they had security guards that were checking our IDs. And I remember one particular incident. There was one, there was two security guards from Northeastern, one who's black, one who's white. And the black one, um, when I was, after I showed my ID and I was like, oh yeah, my name is on the, the thing here too. The black guy got bold with me and was like, nobody asked you about where your ID is or something like that, or, or where your right. name is and all that. And I was like, okay, so this is an attempt now to provoke a situation. Because when you provoke a situation and I end up in handcuffs, then it change, it's going to make the narrative more easier for the university. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that coming just by his tone of voice and the way he was talking to me because all I said was, oh, my name is on the thing here, too. Right. That's right. So they wow. have been nothing but dishonest m m liars and, and just it, it, it just they're, they're just absolutely disgraceful, that university and how they've treated us. What, why? I mean, what is the point of this? Like, how does this... They have a whole African-American, like, research center and stuff. Like, why why go after the arts center? Um, because they want to sell the building or they want to do something with the building or maybe make the building a mega dorm or make, make <laughs> mo get more inroads and <clears throat> make a plane. I mean, they're already pretty much taken over from, what can you say, um, Jackson, uh, what do you call it, Ruggles Station? Yeah. Almost all the way out to Jackson Square. Yep. So yep. it's an expansion situation. Yeah. Um and so the question, why would they do that? Um, it's the same sort of question you could ask Native Americans who cut deals with the white man early, long ago. Yeah, It seems all fine and good and good intention in the beginning, but when you get new people in charge or new people doing whatever, they could be like, oh, screw the agreements. The hell right. with whatever agreements we had to sign. Yeah. We're going to just keep expanding and doing what we want. And this is a, this is a prime example of it. Um, it's a prime example of it. And um, it's a disgrace. It's a an absolute disgrace what that university has done to us. Wow. Yeah. Now, now you know we'll 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 come back to that because I think 
the discussion about the pandemic is going to be an interesting, I, I, I hope we get back to it, uh, mm-hmm. interesting kind of wrench in, in, in Northeastern's works uh, mm-hmm. because uh, a lot of these major universities are in deep trouble now uh, mm-hmm. where students may simply just not come back. And, and maybe universities that pretend to be private. I, I write about these issues uh, for, the, for the viewing audience and higher education. I'm, I'm very critical of the way America calls a lot of its colleges and universities private when actually they're getting, uh, you know, virtually all the money they get, you know, 75% or more in the cases of many schools is coming from student loans that are coming through the U.S. government even if they're privately managed for reasons which we won't go into now. But like, you know, a lot of the money it takes to run a college or university is, is federal, right? Uh, so why are we pretending that they're private when they're not? Why aren't we like other countries where all these schools are public? That said, I mean, w- so without that support, I mean, certainly private schools like Northeastern could literally collapse. You know, they got like a the- lot of tax-free stuff that's gone their way too, though. They do, yeah. They've gotten they they've do. gotten away with a lot of tax. Well, they're free. nonprofits, yeah. I mean, they don't. I mean, that's yeah. right. Yeah, when they have property and stuff, this is all true. But if they don't have that cash coming through, if they don't have enough students, this, mm-hmm. this endless expansion, which everybody knew had to end one day, is going to mm-hmm. end a lot faster than anybody was planning. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if they if their student rolls are cut even ten or twenty percent uh, over the next year or two or three, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, right? And Asian and Latino, et cetera. Um, so my, my overall question in this series, you know, is, this is why I'm talking to you is like, okay, now all this, you know, the whole, the whole, you know, spectacle of American racism and American racism and the arts, you know, kind of, and, and in Boston and the Boston arts already extant. Now the pandemic hits, you know, we, we, we get to March. It may have actually been here as early as December or January, but we didn't know it. Right. Um, and, uh, they but it, it really hits in March. They got caught it in January because I got real sick at work at one point. Yeah, as did I. As so did think I. back and go, maybe you had had it back in January. Yeah, yeah, my dad was in MGH, you know, before he passed away in February, he was in MGH in, in January. And, mm-hmm. you know, there were definitely people that were very sick in the emergency room, you know, which with what could have been flu or could have been, we don't know, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But my wife and I both got sick after having just been sick. So, I mean, yeah, sure. I think a lot of us may have even had this thing pretty early on and just didn't didn't know. And I mean, which is, I'm glad. I mean, that means that we didn't get the bad version, but we, you know, we don't know yet unless we had the antibody test, which I don't think either you or I have had. Okay. So it hits. And one big thing about the arts in general, whatever kind of arts they may be, is that they are public facing, you know, unless you're like the kind of artist that isn't discovered until, you know, they find your corpse on a bunch of artwork that nobody knew you were doing. And you become a, you become like a, a quote unquote, you know, folk artist or whatever, <laughs> like, you, you know, you're sort of like a, an unknown amateur that, that, uh, you know, gets elevated by the art scene as a sort of figure of interest, um, mm-hmm. th- then, you know, you need a public, <laughs> you know, you're not just doing this for yourself, right? So if you're, if you're a musician, if you're a visual artist, like, like we are, you know, if, if you're uh, whatever, you know, literature, whatever, whatever you're doing in the arts, right? Uh, dance, you know, you need a public. And what's the one thing that you cannot have, certainly in the early phases of the pandemic, when we were locking down, is an public. audience, right, in person. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what do you well, think, you'll what notice, did you... You'll notice that a lot of us have, have taken to Facebook. Why, yes, and other, other social media. And here we are yeah. in video doing yep. these interviews, right, not in person with a camera on both of us together, yep. which is how I would have done it. I would have got you over you know, to a studio at the Summerville Media Center where I'm on the board or wherever, or, or not the dig office, which we're, you know, soon now not going to have because why have an office if we're going to be working apart, that. right? Saves us some money for a while and then we can get an office again later. But yeah, I mean, so there, you know, what, so what, like, let's just talk about AMARP already half locked out of the space, you know, for months and months. Now what happens? Like, you know, what happened, yeah. to, you know, AMARP? No idea. Um, the mayor's office, the attorneys, the Northeastern's people are still arguing and figuring out and, and negotiating. And um, Well, I mean, you I, did a show on the street yesterday. I mean, that's what I'm getting at. Like, practically, what are people doing, you know, in the art scene to try to grapple with this stuff? That's pretty much it. Yeah. The show on the street. <laughs> yeah. 
And how does that, I mean, compared to a show in the space, which was nice space, big, yeah, really big. I mean, I was fourth amazed. Floor galleries, third yeah. and fourth floor head galleries. Yeah. yeah. I was at shows there, you know, a couple times, you know, mm -hmm. and you also have permanent displays of every artist's work, you know, you can go around and look at. So, yeah. I mean, you know, numbers wise, how does that work? Like, you know, assuming it's not raining, which it fortunately didn't yesterday, like, What's mm -hmm. the response? You know, what's the difference? In term, the difference between, between shows before the pandemic and shows now, like where you're trying well, to do stuff. Well, now we're outside. Right. But um, it's interesting that our presence in social media has gotten bigger to the point where we get people wanting to join the AMAR group on Facebook that aren't even members of AMAR, but they want to join the group. So we've had a lot of people join the group. <laughs> Um, to see some of the things that we post. So we've posted videos of the artists on the stoop, um, information about grants, scholarships, other exhibits, and things like that that are going on in activities in Boston. So we actually are trying to make it, vi at least in, it, in our own way, make the arts for African Americans viable or that there's opportunities. So if, say, uh, for instance, uh, Rob Pro Black Gibbs, right. you know the artist I'm talking about? He's done those Muralist. great murals, yeah. one over at Madison Park and mm -hmm. one over near the South End. Um, we've been so proud of him and supportive of him. He's not a member of AMAR, but we've posted about his work um, on our site, as well as uh, the place in Grove Hall that they tore down, that wonderful Nelson Mandela, Mandela uh, mural that was painted by Ricardo Gomez. Now we, yeah, we needed to get to this. So I, I'd meant to talk about this. So like we're losing like yeah. even public art by African-American artists right now, right? And then they tried to lie, the construction people tried to lie and say, oh, we discussed it with them. Yeah, they discussed it with them after they tore it down. Oh, great, well, that's good. Oh, we're sorry we hurt your feelings and we're sorry we didn't know this meant something. That thing was like an institution in yep. the city. Yeah. And and everyone loved it and everyone and, and it was really surprising because when they had a protest conversation about it, Lamerchi Frazier, one of the AMR artists, spoke at it. It what I was visiting a friend when I when I happened to drive by and see it. There was a huge crowd out in front of where that where that um, mural was at, and many of those people were white. Mm -hmm. And they were pissed off. They were they were legitimately pissed well, off. I mean, I was thrown out of BU because of my act, you know, activism during the anti-apartheid movement. So for a lot of us that mural was like a landmark, right? So, you know, whatever your color, like if you cared about um, the, the, the struggle of, of um, you know, black South Africans against a racist white state, you cared about like fighting racism in general, you'd care about a mural like that. Because Nelson Mandela, when he came to Boston in 1990, this was just yeah. a huge moment for many of us, you know? Mm. There were just tens of thousands of people out to see him on the Esplanade, you know? Oh yeah. So, so. I remember, well, I remember when they drove through Grove Hall because me, I made signs for my mother and my sister, mm. uh, signs welcoming him when he went through Grove Hall, which yeah. was which was kind of heartbreaking because it was such a quick drive by with the security and whatever. You really didn't <laughs> get a good chance to see him that well. But I remember yeah, how proud was... everybody was all up and down Grove Hall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are Amman on that way two signs all over the city and stuff like that. Yeah. So you know, I mean. Um, but it's the arrogance of tearing down that um, that mural. Whether they're going to, I guess they're going to turn it into some expensive luxury condominiums. Yeah, you like know? so many yeah. other luxury condominiums, you know, that are now, they've yeah. already been sitting empty, like at a 50% vacancy rate in many yeah. parts of the city. They're investment properties. A lot of people with, uh, shall we say, sketchy backgrounds in other countries have been dropping money that comes from points unknown into yeah. real estate just to park it. And, and being allowed to do that, and they don't care whether people are in there or not, you know? All up and down Ashmont Station, there's a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. up and down Ashmont. Yeah. And but I mean, yeah. They disrespected They disrespected him. And we, we I mean, Ricardo's also a member of AMAR, too. Mm -hmm. They disrespected him so badly because that mural, I mean, but this isn't new. I remember down Dudley Station, there used to be a mural painted by Dana Chandler called mm -hmm. Knowledge is Power, Stay in School. Yeah. When they started upgrading Dudley Station, they <clears throat> painted over that mural and there was no conversation about preserving it or doing anything about it. I'm amazed. It's just. <laughs> and so years later, um, the MECO program at the high school I teach at now, Lincoln Sudbury, wanted to paint a mural for the MECO students that celebrated Boston. So they got a friend of mine. 
Thomas Quest Burns to um, paint the mural with some with students. So the the look of the mural has the view of Dudley, but also Mattapan, uh, Roslindale, and uh, where the Museum of African American Art is with the um, giant head John Wilson yep. sculpture. They always call it the big head. Mm-hmm. So on one of the sides of the buildings that they paint, they were painting. It was a blank space. That's like the center of the whole thing. I I told Quest Burns, let me paint the centerpiece. He said, sure. So what I did was I repainted Dana Chandler's mural on this mural that's now permanently hanging up at this suburban white school out in Sudbury. <laughs> but I was like, I want to repaint Dana Chandler's mural. Knowledge is power. Stay in school. But I want it on this mural. I want it on the mural, and it'll be hanging up at that school for who knows how long. Wow. Because he deserved I always felt like he deserved better than that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, much I better. Mean, you know, so now here we are, you know, all this has happened and still happening, you know, and um, pandemics hit and even major art institutions like the Museum of Fine Arts, you know, like the, you know, ICA, like, you know, many others. Right. Um, you know, are, in, are, 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 are hurting, you know, I'm sure even Boston Ballet, Symphony Hall, like all these institutions, you know, oh, yeah. the, the, the Boston Symphony Orchestra and so on and so forth are hurting. I mean, because, you know, um, even people that are like well into the upper middle class are like losing their jobs and stuff like that, you know, and the economy's in a rough place unless you're like Jeff Bezos and Amazon where you're sitting pretty, you know, or you're in like an industry like funeral homes, you know, where you're going to ha- be making more money than usual. Everyone else is having a hard time. So donations are, are down in some sectors. And also you, you can't do the events you normally do to raise money, you know? Yeah. And so, so I, I'm asking you, this is the, the big question, you know, like um, with the whole art scene, you know, kind of in trouble uh, and we don't know how long the pandemic is going to last. Is it mm-hmm. going to be another six months? Is it going to be a year, year and a half, two, three, four? We don't know. Is there going to yeah. be another pandemic down the pike? There almost certainly will be, you know, if not immediately at some point. We have to do this all over again unless we have a less stupid federal government. Um, if, assuming we still have a federal government by that time, but I don't want to be, you know, like too negative about stuff. Um, so, you know, what do you think, how do you think we can rebuild an overall art scene, you know, that's, that's better, uh, in a lot of ways, including being better for African American artists like yourself? Um, a lot of it would, would, will definitely involve... I don't want to say socialism, but some form of socialistic kind of response, which means some institutions got to give something up for free yeah, and, and, and share certain things, certain resources, certain opportunities. Um, I think it's, it's bizarre that mass art, museum of fine arts, museum school are all these three focal institutions of the arts in Boston. And people go from around the world or wherever to go to those, those, that museum or go to those schools and yet, what have they contributed to preserve the, com- the arts in the communities right. of Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, and what have you? Right. Like, even with the Museum of Fine Arts, yeah, you can create something like a program like the <laughs> Nubian Exhibit, but that's you doing something to get money and get people to come in. Yeah. What are you doing to get, go out there in a sense of goodwill? Of, if, it, would inv- it would have to involve something like creating a space. Or, or donating some property for the arts to continue existing. Creating jobs and so on and so forth, too. Exactly. You know, like for your exactly. institution, this is what our, you know, our writer Heather, Heather, Heather Kaplow is writing about. She's going mm-hmm. institution by institution saying, what are you going to do now? Like, yeah. you, you express concern. You know, you're the MFA. We're very concerned about black lives. Black Lives Matter. All right. Congratulations, MFA. Very nice. Now what? So you almost want to say that to the um, real estate developers over here on Center Street who have Black Lives Matter signs. But when you look out front and you see that there's a, a, um, a apartment for for sale or, or a condominium or a place for sale near Franklin Park. <laughs> but it's like almost three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm like, yeah, who's going to buy that? You got the Black Lives Matter sign. But look, again, I'm only worth eight dollars. So right. who's going to buy that? Right. So it's, it's almost offensive. <clears throat> insulting because what it's really going to have to come down to is an altruistic attitude that that is about helping people and not expecting to profit off of helping people or helping people and not demanding that the people owe you something sometimes it it helps to give like the guy you were just talking about who um 
Amazon CEO or whatever. Jeff Bezos, he, yeah. He's not going to live long enough to spend all those trillions and trillions not, of dollars. Not possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's like, so what are you going to do with it? Just keep making more of trillions and trillions. And obviously, that's what he wants to do. Same as the family that owns <sighs> Target or this place or that place. And it's like, is it that important? to have and, and maybe if i was a billionaire or a millionaire i would feel similar to them but I'm, i i always wonder is it that important to just keep making more money while everyone else is poor well we've talked that, about that a tax in massachusetts for you know for the wealthy uh to fund education and transportation for example mm -hmm. we could we could talk about that kind of thing i yep. mean short of what we what we actually need which is progressive taxation in massachusetts which for those of you who don't know it we don't have that in massachusetts nope we do, do not have a graduated income tax at the state level so it's just mm -hmm. like a poor person's paying the same percentage as a rich person that assuming we and that's going to be much harder to change but it would be easier to get specific taxes for specific purposes maybe we could yep. do one for the arts but then if yep. we did that how would we make sure that african-american artists and other artists of color who've been historically disadvantaged in the art scene, you know, gain at least equal opportunities with their white peers. We gotta right? be at the table. Yeah. We absolutely gotta be at the table oh. because there's nothing more, it's, there's, it always gets insulting when, it, when a decision like that does get made. And then someone suddenly, when people get mad at the aftermath, they go, oh, I hadn't thought about y'all. Well, I hadn't thought, I hadn't considered you all. Right. You always want, one of us at the table or some of us not just at the table but participating in the decision making process i mean one of the things that enabled institutions like amarp to start to begin with was community action as part of social movements do yes. you see that kind of action at least in the in the african-american art scene coming out of the current iteration of black lives matter now i mean now that we're we seem to be moving into the political you know sort of institutional phase of a movement like Black Lives Matter, like we've had a ton of street protests, that goes so far. Now it's like, let's elect candidates that are better and let's maybe do stuff like this. Like, do you see yeah. that happening? Um, In Boston, I mean. I think that kind of groundswell helped get Ayanna Presley elected. Yeah. I think that that was, because look at the incumbent she went up against. He'd been there for a while. Right, I actually supported him, but yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I but that, I, there was a there was a groundswell of of folks right. and and people with boots on the ground folks who hadn't um, otherwise been engaged and involved. Right. That right. that that it, it takes that kind of and thing. And that was to before happen. all this crisis. So like yeah. 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 So, but excuse me. You getting a beeping sound? Yeah. It was my someone. So, uh, someone just tried <laughs> to call me. Uh, so we uh, Shay's using the uh, the phone, by the way, um, so he can hear me. We we just a tech issue. That's why he's been holding the receiver up for like almost an hour. We're actually almost an hour, so we probably should wrap up soon. But yeah, yeah. I I wish I had a um, definitive answer, but again, my my attitude is when you got hundreds of millions of dollars, you you should or whatever wealth that the institutions have and you want to preserve the arts or do goodwill with the community, that's going to involve some serious donations. Yeah. And it's going to have to involve creating a safe space or creating a space and not demanding stuff. Now, again, what happens is institutions, they get new people in charge, new people with dis who decide to go in certain directions and they try to screw these folks over. This is exactly what's happening with AMARP right now in Northeastern. Mm -hmm. So Northeastern has new, obviously, it's been through a number of leadership changes since AMARP was founded 40 years ago. Yeah. Right? And so now it's like, oh, y'all don't matter. You didn't mean anything. But initially right. it was the goodwill of, well, we want to buy this building. We're moving towards the community. We're being supportive. And now it's, oh, this is the chance to make a condominium or a dorm or sell it for whatever reasons. Y'all get out. Right. Y'all get right. out. And but, so it comes down to that kind <clears> of thing. You gave a specific, I, I, I'm asking everyone that's participating in these video interviews, starting with Shay, to, to write some comments that we're now, we're, we're running in Dig Boston, so will be coming mm -hmm. out this week. And so when you were starting to talk to, earlier about uh, MassArt and the uh, other couple of institutions that do arts education, specifically, what were they again? SMFA, right? And yeah, SMFA. School Museum of Museum of Fine Arts, Art. sorry. Yeah. And the Museum of Fine Arts itself. That they... Yeah like right next to each other and it's like and the three of them are in a row basically for those of you yeah, don't know, and i'm like y'all you know, can't come up with something you were talking about them coming up with a community space right yeah absolutely yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. I think mass art does weekend classes, but they charge practically an arm and a leg. A lot of the students can't can't afford those. Right. I mean, right. I got some kids in Sudbury who have taken classes there, but those classes are really expensive. Yep. Yep. And so it's uh, just like, well, what is it to to make you want to aspire to be an artist and really pursue it further if if there's not a lot of institute? I mean, obviously having teachers and adults and people around you to encourage it is important. But where are the institutions that are really going to welcome you there without saddling you with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt yep. or helping you have a space or a situation where you can do a lot of great creative stuff and it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. And that's why I keep saying the goodwill and the altruistic <laughs> attitude towards doing this just to do the right thing. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of institutions, it's about the almighty dollar. Yeah. Even when they're supposedly nonprofit, we see this all the time especially yeah. at the commanding heights of sort of the art scene, you know, like the, the biggest institutions with the most money are often mm -hmm. the most frugal when it comes to helping, you know, communities that they've helped, you know, put in the positions that they're in, in sort of the down positions they're in, you know. So like, yeah, I mean, uni universities that have arts programs that are predominantly white could, you know, put out some more scholarships for African-American art students, right? I mean, yeah. could this not happen? Could there not be more programs that benefit African-American high school students and K through yep. eight students, you know, Th mm. this all seems, you know, like L dig bus and this little, you know, company we have. And then this little nonprofit that the same three of us run Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. We're out teaching, you know, Boston public <laughs> school students, you know, every year at one point or another. Right. I mean, in, in Somerville and elsewhere too, like yep. you got to give back. Right. So, I mean, all right, I guess we can, you know, I don't, I don't want to, you know, sort of, um, uh, go on and on. You know, we've been we've been talking about an hour, and, and we should kind of bring this to a close. But uh, another thing before we do, though, yeah, I any would last say thoughts? Is yeah. A yeah. lot of these white art groups, organizations, and things like that that are out there, they need to come see us, or at least mm -hmm. start a relationship with us, because the boat the boat is sinking. They're yeah. going down too. Yeah. Perhaps it, it's time to really come together because. Um, to be honest with you, a lot of them, they, it's not like a lot of these institutions or these other organizations reach out to us. And I'm talking um, Somerville Arts and, and uh, some of these other places that have these arts institutes, these arts situations that I didn't even know about until you and I were in graduate school. Right. I mean, that's and what it, graduate school is for, too. You find out about this stuff if yeah, you didn't you, know it. You, 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 know? you got to go look for mentors and you find out someone's <clears> a member of the Somerville Arts something, something, something. And I'm like, I never even heard of them. I didn't know right. they existed. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, I mean, sure. And I mean, for those of you that don't know, in the visual arts scene, especially the way, one of the ways among the ways that that people become big deals, you know, kind of famous or near famous or whatever as artists is because they get it's it's sort of like the scouting system for major league sports, you know, where you, where you have scouts often called that, that literally go out looking for talent, talent scouts, right? You know, essentially. Yeah. And um, uh, in the arts world, it's like institutions like museums that have curators, you know, gallerists from different galleries, they go do studio visits about people they're hearing about, people that might have gotten written up in a paper like Dig Boston or whatever. But unfortunately, most <laughs> news outlets are, are you know, uh, um, first of all, are, are white run, including yep. Dig, right? But unlike Dig, most of them are not out looking for all kinds of talent, like feeling that like this part of our mission to cover all the communities in our pur in our purview, right? A lot of yep. a lot of a lot of um, white run operations and media don't do this. So like if they're not writing about different talent and you've got, you know, mostly white curators and gallerists that aren't looking at black publications, black news outlets that may write about stuff or other outlets of color, they're never going to hear about folks, maybe by word of mouth, but it's less likely if their circles are mostly white. So they're not going to go do those studio visits. They're not going to go to shows in parts exactly. of town they're unfamiliar with and in fact scared of, you know, because yep. of racism, because of, you know, the rumor mill. Oh, that it's not safe over there. Oh, Oh, you mean it's black? Is that what you mean? You're saying it's not safe, but you mean it's black, right? So that means that that talent doesn't get discovered, even when it's I mean, we're talking it's not even a mile from places like MFA that there are major black communities and institutions like high schools, Roxbury Community College. It's like under a mile and it yeah. might as well be on two different planets. 
I remember having an exhibit at AMARP and a white woman asked me one time, how come you don't bring your art to the suburbs where they can really use it and, and really learn from it because it's so political? And how come you don't never, you, your work's not as though somehow it's my fault that the suburbs had never heard of me. Right. And I took it in stride. I didn't get mad, but I was kind of like, well, have any of them bothered coming to discover who I am? I've been here over 20 years. I don't know who to look for. Uh, so I was kind of like, that's kind of a dumb question. But the way she phrased it was like, you got all this talent and it, you sh you're showing stuff in Jamaica Plain and Roxbury. How come you're not in the suburbs where they can learn from you and all? And I'm like, number one, that's not my obligation. But number two, it's not like I'm just going to bring a whole bunch of my stuff to like Newton and go, anybody want to see some black art? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. what do you do? It's like, it's <sighs> so stupid and insulting. Well, but, I mean, I've heard a lot of weird stuff over the years, a lot of weird stuff. So the takeaway is people have to be more open to like other people, like right around them in the African-American yeah. community and other communities. And I'm talking about white people here, but all people in all communities need to communicate more, need to be friendlier and more open, nicer to each other, you know, help each other, share each other. And this this could be a road forward for the boss. You know, our we, scene. We're pretty much in the same boat now. Uh huh. Yeah. And that's. You know, being all of us being downwardly mobile at the same time maybe is not such a great thing. So, yeah. all right. Well, Shay Justice, thank you so much, um, you know, for coming you, on man. with me today. And, um, you know, um, we're going to put some information about, you know, um, how to get a hold of you and any any institution like AMARP you think that folks should, like, give some donations to or whatever in the, uh, in the you know, sort of, um, you know, the information on this video. Uh, and uh, to any of you all um, who want to... Uh, um, you know, uh, be interviewed like this. Um, you know, you're you're in the art scene in Boston. You have something to say, or in cities right around Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Quincy, Everett, whatever. You know, um, so you can get a hold of of, of me and my fellow editors uh, at editorial at digboston.com. So, um, thanks, Shay. Um, we'll be we'll be talking in person soon, and hopefully in this format, and and uh, and even a, t a two shot in a studio when the pandemic's over. So. That would be great. Uh, before I say goodbye, I definitely want to mention, um, I, I wanted to say he hello to my mom that I'm doing this. I told her I might be doing something else. <laughs> she made this wonderful uh, mask that I'm wearing right now. Oh, Ellen cool. Ellen Teresa Justice, love my mother to death. Wanted to definitely <laughs> give her a shout out for that. Very nice. All right. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks yeah. a lot, Shay. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, you folks. You got it. Bye-bye. Thanks for hanging with us. Bye.